Okay, so Wednesday, September 30th, Biology 107. So welcome and good afternoon, happy Wednesday. We are going to talk about uh, more organelles and cellular compartments today. Uh, we're also gonna talk a little bit about the midterm and Friday we're going to spend the whole time for midterm review. I haven't decided what I'm doing yet for the review for the midterm, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about it today uh, after we're done covering topic six. Before we get to the midterm, I do want to talk about those formal reports though, and today I want to talk about the results section. So what is the results section? The results section is where you are basically presenting the data. So this is going to have really two components. You're going to have a written component. So the written component is going to be a paragraph, maybe three paragraphs uh, with the amount of data that we have, and it's going to summarize the results. So for example, we had uh, three components to our results. We had a standard curve, we had a temperature experiment, and we had a solvent experiment. So you're gonna talk a little bit about that in just really very, very brief. So the temperature experiment, you're gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh, what the results showed. So maybe you saw that uh, as the temperature increased, we saw more damage to the heat root membranes, and you're gonna to refer to the data. So the data is going to be presented uh, more specifically in the form of three graphs, and that is what your results section is going to have. So I'll give you some examples in a moment of what the written section might look like. So what does the results section not include? You're not going to have your tables there. Uh, the tables, that data goes in the appendix, that's the rough data, and so um, I'm going to look at your tables uh, uh, and give you a check mark if they're included. Um, as a, you know, right at the back of your report. Uh, and if I have any issues with your graphs, I might look at the tables to see if you did something weird with the calculations. You're also not gonna discuss the data, meaning you're gonna interpret it. And that is gonna be left for the discussion question or discussion section, I mean. So the written portion. So be brief, but you wanna be uh, informative and specific. I'm always looking for everyone to be specific and tell me exactly what is going on. Okay, if you have to sacrifice anything, if you have to not be brief, I would rather you be specific than be brief, but I would like you to be brief and concise. It's a, it's a good uh, tool to have in your belt as well. So take a look, I have a couple of examples here. So you can see I have uh, the first one, it says, it was found that the most extreme temperatures caused the largest amount of beta cyan leakage. The 20 degrees Celsius treatment resulted in 16 micromolars of leakage, and the 85 degrees Celsius resulted in 10.5 micromoles per liter of leakage, figure two. You can see number, the second one says, the highest temperatures and the lowest temperature gave the highest absorbance values, demonstrating the extreme temperatures damage membranes the most. So I think it's obvious which one is better. I mean, look at this. First of all, we're referring to the data Okay, that's really important that you refer to the figures so that I can read your, you know, what you have written. And if I want to know really more, then I know where to go to find that information. You can see I'm giving some specifics. I'm not just saying that there's lots of damage at the high temperatures. I'm telling you what the high temperature is and exactly how much damage there is. So there's different ways to do this. Uh, you can see I've kind of uh, squeezed a lot into one sentence. That's a pretty wordy sentence. Uh, it works, but it's uh, it's a little wordy. It might be better to, you know, maybe make this into two or three sentences. But that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all you're going to uh, have for the temperature portion. You'll have something for the solvent portion as well. Make sure you don't copy my sentence word for word. That would be plagiarism. You do want to use your own words. So the other thing uh, you're going to have are your graphs. And uh, I think I actually showed something similar to this in the, uh, the lab presentation. Uh, some tips on graphing. So you can see we have a few things here I want to point out. So clearly defined data points, uh, nice big symbols, uh, whether you're doing this on graph paper or if you're doing it on uh, Excel, you want to make sure that you do that. Uh, we're having uh, our axes labeled and we have the appropriate units. You can see we have the title. The title is going to have your binomial name. So beta vulgaris is what uh, the binomial name for beets is, and what was done. So this particular experiment here is the temperature experiment it seems to be referring to, and so you better have the word temperature somewhere in that title 
you better talk about membranes somewhere in the title and what you were trying to do. And the last thing I don't think I've labeled, but I'll circle it here, is your figure is going to have a number. So this could be figure one, or maybe you have a code because this is lab three, so three dash two, figure A, B, C. Uh, there should be some sort of sequence or systematic way, way that you're numbering your figures. So that's it for now with results. Um, I will talk a little bit about discussion on Friday and, uh, and we'll have our, our midterm review as well, of course. So back to organelles and compartments and those kind of things. We finished off in the Golgi body and now we're gonna talk about lysosomes. So that word there, lyse, that means something like uh, breaking or um, uh, bursting or, or something like that. Uh, I'm not exactly sure the derivative of the word, but uh, it, it means something like that. And so what's going on in a lysosome is things are getting broken down. These are very much like cellular stomachs. They're, they're acidic, just like your, your normal stomach. And uh, you can see uh, in this particular slide, a lysosome being formed. So take a look, we're, we're seeing all those organelles that we've talked about already. We've got our, um, our rough ER. So we have some proteins that are being made there. Proteins get put into a transport vesicle, then they go to a Golgi body, and then they go to another vesicle. And these, these proteins in this particular example are digestive proteins. And so in this case, we're bringing in some sort of food here by phagocytosis. So that's a process we talked about. And eventually here you can see it's merging with those digestive enzymes and making a digestive compartment or you could call it a cellular stomach. There is another process there I'll talk about in a moment. I'll get to that in a second there, autophagy, and we'll talk about what that is in a second. Uh, here's just a, a recap of ex endocytosis and exocytosis. So en endocytosis is bringing something in. In this case here, they're using the term phagocytosis, meaning it's non-specific eating. And uh, what you're seeing in this particular diagram is uh, some sort of white blood cell, and it's uh, bringing in a bacterial invader, destroying it and it's actually just secreting the waste at the end in the process of exocytosis down here at the bottom. So lysosomes are involved in phagocytosis. They're basically digesting food, and uh, this is very similar to the diagram I showed you before. You can see the membranes of the lysosome, which are in purple, are fusing with the, the yellow browny uh, food vacuoles there. The other process I want to mention is something called autophagy, so this word here, phagy, so phage, sometimes we use the term, uh, means eating. So that's great, self-eating. So what, what is eating here? We're, sometimes organelles get old and uh, they need to be broken down. Uh, mitochondria in particular have all sorts of enzymes and uh, uh, free radicals and, and oxidative species that are dangerous. So we want to uh, just not let that loose when it's breaking down. We're gonna digest the whole thing down in a lysosome and recycle all those, uh, all those uh, nutrients and parts. So the next one are vacuoles. And uh, so believe it or not, we've actually talked about three types of vacuoles already in Biology 107. So the first one is shown in this slide, that's a one. And that is the central vacuole that you see in plants. So uh, there's, a, there's an image there of, of the central vacuole and uh, we talked a little bit about it. Uh, it's surrounded by the tonoplast in the beetroot cells that has a pigment in it, but these vacuoles basically are full of water and solutes, sometimes a few other things like pigments, and what they're doing is they're bringing in water. So when you water your uh, flowers or if you water, put water with your vegetables, get them crisp. This is where the water goes. It goes to the vacuole, which is, like I said, mostly storage, mostly water. Sometimes you have other things. Certain tissues might have sap or, you know, in the case of the beets, pigments or, or other certain molecules they're storing in these vacuoles. Uh, the other two types of vacuoles we talked about, and I have slides for each of them, uh, we talked about uh, just a moment ago, food vacuoles. So food vacuoles, of course, uh, are just something that is brought in by phagocytosis and there's food in there that's going to eventually merge with a lysosome and, and get digested. So all these things, these vacuoles, they're all membrane bound, by the way. And the third type that we talked about 
was maybe a couple of weeks ago now, and we talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, contractile vacuoles. So contractile vacuoles. And those are seen in organisms like paramecium where they're pumping water out. So I've got a slide for each of these, by the way. Uh, there's another slide showing the tonoplast, and you can see in this particular cell, there's some sap being stored there. That's not in every tissue, it's only in certain tissues that the sap is gonna be stored. And um, it is in this one anyway. There's an electron micrograph of the central vacuole and a uh, pretty nice electron micrograph. You can actually see a lot of components. We can see the nucleus, we can see a bunch of chloroplasts and then the central vacuole is it's really quite massive. So there's our contractile vacuole found in paramecium. So if you watch where the arrow is very carefully, uh, maybe about every 10 seconds or so, you're going to see uh, water being pumped out. So I'll just watch it now. I think it's about to go. There it goes. Kind of looks like a little circle that uh, starts off large and then it, it, just, it just shrinks. And uh, so that's for pumping of water. This paramecium doesn't have a cell wall. And so what does it do? Well, it pumps out water. That's how it gets rid of excess water by, uh, by pumping it out. Okay. So... I think now we're at the point where I should probably make a couple of notes. We were making some notes uh, in a Word document. I just have to find my Word document. Okay, there it is. So eukaryotic organelles, this was the document we were making here last time. And now we want to add um, lysosomes to this. So lysosomes are, we'll call them digestive compartments. We have different kinds of vacuoles. So I'll make a note for each of them. We have the central vacuole in a plant. I'm not gonna put just plants because you do sometimes find them in other organisms such as uh, fungal cells and some protists, but mostly we are talking about plants. So this is storage of water and we'll just say solutes. And in solutes, I can list things like sap or pigments. Okay, second one we have was the food vacuole. And this is produced by phagocytosis. And the last one is we have the contractile vacuole. And this pumps water out in hypotonic environment. Okay, and maybe I'll just fold those so we can see them just a little bit better. There we go. Okay, so next one uh, we talked about, um, what did we talk about? I guess we finished talking about vacuoles. I was going to add peroxisome to that. That's the next one. Peroxisomes. And uh, let's take a look at those slides first. So peroxisomes, uh, you probably gather from the name, it has something to do with peroxide. So peroxide is this chemical here, H2O2. Uh, and uh, you might be familiar with peroxide if you've ever bleached your hair. Uh, it's a very reactive compound and uh, it takes out pigments in hair, and, and uh, it's, it's, like I said, it's very, very reactive. So sometimes our, our cells make peroxides as a byproduct of other reactions. So peroxisomes will break that down. Uh, and the other thing to say about peroxisomes is that there's a lot of specialized functions that can happen in peroxisomes. It just really just depends on the tissue and the type of organism. So you can see I have a note there about breaking down long and branched fatty acids. So normal fatty acids are broken down into mitochondria. Uh, sometimes they have little branches or they're too long and so they go to the peroxisome first. So that's kind of a specialized feature of something that happens in, in uh, animal cells. So I think, do I have another picture of a peroxisome? Yeah, here's, a, here's something that's happening in plants. There's something called the glyoxisome. That's a type of plant peroxisome. And you can see it says here it's turning fats into sugars. 
So this is part of the germination process when seeds germinate. Uh, so I'll, I'll make a note about peroxisomes here. Um, don't really want to get into them too much because uh, there's all sorts of weird specialized features that they can do. But I will say that they break down hydrogen peroxide. And I will say lots of specialized features in various cells. And the example I will give is breakdown of branched or long amino acids in animals. Okay, so we're getting near the end. We actually don't have a lot more to talk about in this particular unit. Uh, and you're probably thinking, what about mitochondria and chloroplasts? And they are actually next. So let me just go back to that note for a second here. So I'm gonna highlight, uh, take a look at all these things here. So all these things here, uh, with the exception of, uh, well, er everything here that has a membrane is part of the endomembrane system, uh, except for the mitochondria and chloroplasts. So we're gonna talk about those mitochondria. Maybe I'll make my notes right now. You probably know a little bit about these things. And chloroplasts. So mitochondria, this is the site of cellular respiration. And of course, chloroplasts are the site of photosynthesis. Okay, so back to the PowerPoint. Let's talk about mitochondria and chloroplasts. Uh, they're not part of the endomembrane system. So what does that mean? It means all those vesicles and, and those kind of things don't merge with the mitochondria and chloroplasts. Uh, in fact, the number of proteins and other things are synthesized on site uh, in the mitochondria or the chloroplasts. In fact, if you take a look here, uh, it's right in this label here, it says that this mitochondria has its own ribosomes and uh, same thing with this chloroplast. And uh, the other thing you may have noticed is that they both have their own DNA. So we're going to talk about that in a moment. Show you some pictures of mitochondria. Mitochondria are pretty cool. Uh, lots of neat pictures of them. There's all these cartoons kind of make them look like little uh, uh, orange or red jelly beans. Uh, but they, uh, they can have uh, quite a bit of different interesting appearances. So here's the one from the textbook. You can see they have the cartoon on the left. And you have the uh, electron micrograph on the right. So one thing to point out is that, that mitochondria are double membraned organelles. Uh, this is kind of unique for the most part, other than like the nucleus, but it's, uh, uh, it's kind of interesting to see that. And so we're going to talk about those two membranes a lot more when we talk about respiration. There's another picture. This is that sort of hybrid one where you've got the cartoon attached to the electron micrograph. And so you can see an artist is trying to make it look a little bit like a, a longer bean. This time they're using a different color, but usually orange or red are the often colors are used for mitochondria. There's an electron micrograph and you can see they're using red. Everyone wants to use red because mitochondria use oxygen and oxygen is like fire, I guess. And of course there's, you know, respiration going on, which is the oxidation of your fuels. There's another cartoony structure and you can see the double membrane system, the outer and the inner membranes. And I really like this one. This is very cool. I'm not exactly sure how they did this technique, some sort of scanning electron microscopy. And they, you can see the, all the three dimensions. It's really very, very beautiful. There's another one, just some cross sections. I like mitochondria, so lots of pictures of them. And there's another one from the textbook showing that they're not always necessarily forming these bean structures. Uh, there's a lot of research starting to show that uh, these mitochondria can actually fuse together and they can form kind of these weird networks. So this is a picture showing the networks of these mitochondria being attached together, which I thought was, is pretty cool. So what about chloroplasts? This is the site of photosynthesis. And uh, this is the green part of the plant. So you see all those plant cells and they're always colored green. Well, the only green part is actually the chloroplasts. And in fact, a very specific part of chloroplasts, the thylakoids. So if you take a look at chloroplasts, is actually a three-membrane system. 
There's an inner mem there's an outer membrane, an inner membrane, and then the styloquoids. And the green part, of course, is where the chlorophyll is found. So there's the chloroplast uh, seen in the Elodea cells that we looked at uh, last week or the week before. Uh, some cartoons, again, you know, you can see that three membrane system. Maybe this was not the best one, but usually they look something like this. Uh, we're going to talk more about uh, uh, chloroplast structure. I was just going to point out that these stacks of things, these are called uh, thylakoids. They look like stacks of pancakes, and that's where all the chlorophyll is found. There's a picture. Uh, some of these chloroplasts seem to form networks as well. So some kind of cool things that are going on there with chloroplasts and mitochondria. Uh, there's another picture of a chloroplast. Uh, I like this one because you can actually see the starch granules right here. And uh, so, of course, we have photosynthesis going on, and photosynthesis is making, um, in some cases, glucose, and the glucose is being stored as starch. So something that people don't think about when they think about uh, chloroplasts is that, that sometimes that's where starch is stored. So I wanted to uh, just take a minute and talk about uh, these um, organelles and why mitochondria and chloroplasts may not be part of the endomembrane system. Uh, they seem a lot more independent. And so uh, people are looking at these things and seeing that they have their own DNA and they have uh, these double membranes, which kind of is like, okay, was that something that was consumed by phagocytosis? And uh, so this whole idea uh, that these mitochondria and chloroplasts, uh, some sort of, uh, you know, back in ancient history, maybe these things were some sort of uh, a bacteria, right? So uh, mitochondria being some sort of aerobic bacteria and the chloroplast being some sort of photosynthetic bacteria. And they're brought in by, um, brought in by phagocytosis. And then rather than getting consumed, uh, they became part of that cell. And now we have these cells that we call eukaryotic cells with all sorts of fancy organelles and whatnot. So this, uh, this theory is called the, uh, of the origins of mitochondria and chloroplasts, it's called the endosymbiotic theory. And uh, I think you talk about a little bit more in biology 108, you take more cell biology, you're going to talk about it, there's lots of interesting things about it. Uh, I was going to make a couple of notes about, uh, you know, why uh, this theory has a lot of uh, credibility. Uh, of course, nobody has a time machine, but uh, there's certainly a lot of interesting things about mitochondria and chloroplasts that do support this. So evidence that supports the endosymbiotic theory. So the first thing to say is you may have noticed that all those mitochondria look like beans or in some cases, uh, bacteria. So size and shape, I'll say resemble bacteria. So that's number one. Um, so mitochondria, I'm just gonna use a big M and a big C for chloroplasts have their own DNA, and their DNA is a circular chromosome. So where have we seen that before? Of course, E. coli has a circular chromosome. Now, just for comparison, E. coli has about four to 5,000 genes. The human mitochondria, I think it's like 17 genes. So it's not really a complete genome, but it does resemble, of course, um, a bacterial chromosome being circular. So mitochondria and chloroplasts also have their own ribosomes. And these ribosomes are 70S ribosomes. So where did we see 70S ribosomes? Of course, bacteria as well. Uh, I mentioned the two membrane system. So two membranes suggests being taken in by phagocytosis. And the last thing is genetic resemblance. So genetic resemblance of mitochondria and chloroplast genes with bacterial genes. So if you take a look at the genomes of these things and you take a look at the genomes of uh, um, bacterial cells, uh, there's, there's some similarities that suggest uh, relatedness. That uh, whole concept we were talking about way back in topic one, phylogeny. If you do phylogenetic analysis of mitochondria and chloroplasts uh, of, of their genomes, it does suggest they belong with the bacteria. So anyway, that's about it. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about for, um, for the endosymbiotic theory.
Uh, interesting discussion. If you want to talk about it some other time, that's fine, but we're going to move on in class here. Okay, so uh, I do, I'm just looking at the time here. I will make sure I do have time at the in, in a few minutes for the midterm. Um, at the moment, I just want to kind of talk about some actual eukaryotic cells. So this is kind of the picture that you see in your textbook. It's got a eukaryotic cell and it's got all those organelles loaded in there. But let's take a look at some some real eukaryotic cells and, and talk about some of the differences. So between, for example, animal cells and plant cells. So here is a typical animal cell, although it says typical, but maybe you've noticed that it has a flagella and not all animal cells have flagellas. Oh, somebody's saying they can't see the slides. I forgot to share the slides. There we go. Here's your animal cell. Thank you for the note. Uh, so this is, this is an animal cell and it's not really typical. Like I said, you know, you look at these features, we've got a flagellum, we've got these microvilli. Uh, these are not found in all animal cells. But what they are trying to do is show you the features that might be found in an animal cell. And uh, usually it's never even anywhere close to, to scale. Like the Golgi apparatus there, for example, is way too large. There's no way the Golgi is bigger than a mitochondria. But again, there, you know, some artist is trying to make everybody happy who will say, we need this in there, we need the microvilli, we need the endoplasmic reticulum, so they're just cramming everything in there. So here's a, a micrograph from the textbook of an animal cell, and uh, like I said, they come in many shapes and sizes. You probably know that. We have muscle cells. Uh, this is the lining, a uh, cell from the lining of the uterus. We have neurons. We have blood cells, skin cells, uh, many shapes and sizes. You can see we have the, uh, the nucleus here and the nucleolus, and what we're seeing here, uh, these internal structures, you can kind of see them. That's probably mostly endoplasmic reticulum in there. Uh, and much of that, of course, will be studded with, uh, with ribosomes. So notice my notes here about our animal cells, some things we talked about already. Uh, animal cells have no cell walls. They might have an extracellular matrix. This one here, I don't think has an extracellular matrix. Uh, maybe at the bottom here, there's some connective tissue of some sort. I'm not sure what that is. It's hard to tell. And we are chemoheterotrophs. That means we feed off of other things by ingestion. Here's another animal cell. This one has been colored really nicely. Uh, you can see we have two nucleoli, I guess is the word for plural for nucleolus, nucleoli. Um, those red things are the mitochondrions. Um, and the mitochondria, uh, like I said, they're often colored red. The blue are spotted ribosomes all over. And you can see some endoplasmic reticulum right here. They've also labeled some lysosomes. Animal cells like to eat things, so they have lots of uh, uh, digestive compartments. And that's about all we can see on there. The Golgi is probably too small uh, to see, or maybe needs to be uh, uh, colored in a special way. Again, these are three-dimensional cells, and sometimes when you have a cross-section, you're not going to see the whole thing. Well, that's a very nice picture. So what about plant cells? Uh, you notice right away they're usually uh, drawn as some sort of box or geometrical shape, and that's because of the cell wall. So that's kind of a big feature of a plant cell. The difference between a plant cell and an animal cell, of course, is the cell wall. And of course, you probably know that uh, plant cells often, not always, uh, have uh, these chloroplasts. So not all plant cells have chloroplasts, right? Uh, just the green part of the plant. Hopefully you know that. So the stem and the roots usually don't have chloroplasts. Uh, it's usually just the green part, which usually is the leaves. And in smaller plants, it might include the stem. We also have this big central vacuole. And uh, of course, you know, plants have their own specialized cells as well. They can have uh, uh, phloem and leaves and, and, and stem cells and, and uh, root cells, etc. So here's a, uh, this is a colorized electron micrograph of a plant cell. You can see the vacuole in the middle is very large. You've got a bunch of chloroplasts crammed in there. And of course the cell wall is uh, this big, that big thick thing all around it. Here's another plant cell. Uh, this is from something called duckweed. Uh, if you've ever had an aquarium and if you've ever had duckweed, you know all about it. It's very hard to get rid of. It just grows like a weed. Uh, you can see we have the nucleus and the nucleolus. Uh, interestingly, a lot of plant cells will have actually many nucleoli. Uh, this one's only showing one, but it's not uncommon for plant cells to have dozens of them. Uh, and plant cells tend to be a little bit larger. Um, other note up there, I think I've mentioned already, plant cells are, of course, uh, 
usually characterized as being photosynthetic, but that would be only the green part of the plant. There's another electron micrograph of plant cell. Again, uh, they're showing the, uh, the one interesting thing they've done here is the chloroplasts. So the chloroplasts here, you can see they've colored them yellow. I'm not sure why they did that. Notice they're using different term plastid. We'll talk about what it means by plastid later on in the semester. Um, but uh, in this case, it just means chloroplast. So what about fungal cells? I mentioned we'd be talking a little bit about them. Uh, they do have a cell wall. The cell wall is, of course, made out of chitin. And they're chemoheterotrophs, just like us. They eat stuff. Uh, although usually most fungal cells are decomposers. Some of them are pathogenic, right? You might get athlete's foot or something like that. Uh, we have different kind of fungi. Uh, fungal cells include, of course, we have yeast. Yeast are unicellular fungi. Uh, you might have mushrooms. So mushrooms are large uh, reproductive structures of uh, fungi that are found underground. And then we have molds. Molds are kind of like fuzzy little uh, things that have uh, all these little finger-like projections. So take a look at that uh, diagram. You can see we have a nucleus. I don't know what happened in the nucleus. It looks kind of squished, but there is a central vacuole. And sometimes it can be quite large in some fungal cells. And the mitochondria then are, are also colored uh, uh, orange or red again, as usual. So last thing I want to talk about in, the, in, this, in this unit was um, uh, protists, because uh, next week lab, we are going to look at some protists. So protists are uh, eukaryotes, and they are not plants, they are not animals, they are not fungi. That's the definition of a protist. Many of them, most of them, are unicellular. So we're going to talk about a few different types here, uh, and I'll show you some pictures. Uh, here's a protist here. Uh, this is kind of a weird thing. I, I thought this is a very interesting protist because you can see it has flagella. So that means that this protist is motile. It can move around like an animal cell, but hey, it also has chloroplasts. So it's animal-like and plant-like. Uh, and this is why protists are very weird and interesting because uh, many of them have animal-like and plant-like or sometimes just other weird qualities about them. Uh, we are gonna be looking at this particular protist in the lab. This is the paramecium. Oh, well, there's an error in my lecture notes that should be italicized. Uh, and, um, Paramecium are, you know, usually considered to be animal-like in that they swim around and they're covered with all these cilia. So we're going to talk about cilia in the, in the next unit, I guess, after the midterm uh, as a, a type of motility structure similar to a flagella. Here's another protist we're going to talk about. This is the euglena. This one has the flagella and the chloroplasts. And so, like I said, animal-like and plant-like. So they're kind of interesting little things. Okay, so before we look at the midterm, I do have a Kahoot for you. So load up the app and I have, I think, a 10 question Kahoot where we're gonna talk about some organelles and see how, you, how you're doing with uh, remembering what these things are doing. So let me load that up. Okay, there it is. Okay, I see some people are joining now. I'll give you about another uh, 15, 20 seconds. Okay, here we go. This one's gonna be pretty quick. I think I have most of the questions programmed for 10 instead of 20 seconds, so good luck. Nutrients, waste, and water can all be stored in which organelle? Okay, vacuoles. So start off with an easy one. We just talked about vacuoles, so hopefully um, you knew that one. Scoreboard. 
Question two, which organelle's job matches this image? So the correct answer is lysosome. Lysosomes, remember, break things down. So I see a bunch of people answered peroxisome. Uh, there's no peroxide in that particular diagram. Uh, so breaking things down the lysosome. They're gonna get a little bit harder. Question three, this organelle encloses and supports the cell in plants. So the correct answer is cell wall. Uh, yeah, I found that question on another Kahoot online. I don't think I would necessarily call the cell wall an organelle. It's not a membrane bound thing, but it is an important structure of the plant cell, of course. Okay, looking good. Question four, the role of this organelle is to package and process proteins within the cell. Correct answer is Golgi apparatus, so well done. Scoreboard getting mixed up a little bit. Question five, which organelle is responsible for converting organic molecules into ATP? Correct answer is the mitochondria. So I didn't want to say glucose because we don't just eat glucose, or I hope you don't just eat glucose, but organic molecules. So what is converting our food into ATP? That's the mitochondria. Okay, question six. Which pair of structures is found in both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells? Correct answer is cell membrane and ribosomes. So remember, uh, mitochondria are not found in bacteria. Uh, nuclei are not found in bacteria. And circular DNA is not found in eukaryotes, or at least not usually. Okay, so a few more questions. Let's see if you can get your uh, place back there, Ryden. Question seven. The internal framework that adds support to the nuclear membrane is called. Okay, that time goes fast. The answer is nuclear lamina. That's those uh, fibrous uh, structures that are inside the nuclear membrane to give it shape. Question eight, which part of the cell membrane helps to stabilize the phospholipids? So I mentioned this just in passing. I wanted to throw you a hard one and see who got it. So the correct answer is cholesterol. So cholesterol, uh, yeah, that's what it does. It stabilizes the phospholipids. Make sure that they're not too fluid or, or too solid. It kind of stabilizes them in the kind of correct amount of fluidness for a membrane. Okay, I think two more questions. What part of the cell membrane assists helping cells identify each other? Carbohydrates is the correct answer. So I see some people have put enzymes. Uh, not necessarily. Carbohydrates, as I mentioned, on the outside of membranes are kind of like identifier tags. They're little bag tags that say, hey, this is a red blood cell, or this is a skin cell, or a liver cell. So that's what the carbohydrates are doing. They're identification markers in eukaryotes. Okay, I think one more question. Which of the following is not true about the smooth endoplasmic reticulum?
synthesizes proteins is the correct answer. Remember, that's the job of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The other things are true about this move. Okay, let's see how the scoreboard comes out. Bronze. Brianne, well done. Silver for Latin. Who's going to be? Who's going to be? Shane. Wow. No one saw that one come in. Slow start, Shane. Okay. So one or two more quick things to say about this unit, and then we're going to spend 10 minutes talking about the midterm. So, oops. What is going on with my slides here? Try that again, there we go. Okay, so take a look at the notes. I have a couple of videos there you can check out. Uh, YouTube links for them and talks a little bit of an animal cell and a plant cell. And uh, they're actually pretty good videos. They talk about a lot of features that we've discussed and have some nice pictures uh, on them. Okay, so let's talk about the midterm. I do want to make sure I have lots of time to talk about the midterm. Uh oh, what did I just do to zoom here? So hold on a second here. It says the screen sharing is paused. Okay, I didn't mean to screen pause that. I meant to show this. There we go. So let's talk about the midterm. I'm hoping this is not what's going to happen or from the computer or wherever you're learning stuff from. Uh, I'm hoping you're going to do really well. Uh, and everyone loves cell biology. Uh, so our midterm is on Monday. It's gonna be through Moodle and it's gonna be using the lockdown browser. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. Uh, I haven't done a lot of these online exams myself. So uh, this is usually what my format is. Multiple choice, true and false, some definition questions, some matching and some long answer. Uh, I, might, uh, I might switch it around a little bit. Uh, um, I'm not sure yet. I, I just have to think about it in terms of putting it together for the for the um, uh, for the Moodle system. Uh, but uh, it'll, it'll be roughly like this anyway. I might tweak it a little bit. Maybe I'll make a couple extra multiple choice or or something like that. Uh, like the definition questions, for example, um, they're a lot better um, when I'm actually get a chance to see your writing, and it's a lot harder to see written responses in an online system. So it'll be about 35 marks worth 15% of your grade. So let's talk about this lockdown browser thing. Um, so this lockdown browser is a system that we've uh, subscribed to here at the college. And uh, if this is the first midterm that you're doing, uh, you know, I want you to focus on the studying, but you do need to focus a little bit on the technology here. And so what the lockdown browser does is uh, it activates your webcam and it watches you while you do the test, right? So we want to make sure that people are studying and treating this as an in-person exam. So what that means is you're going to study and it is not going to be open book. So you need to study. The lockdown browser is going to watch you and record you doing your exam. Uh, so, you know, make sure that uh, uh, you don't have any papers around or that you're not talking to people, but you're in a private location and you are, you know, hopefully quiet and, and you have good internet. So the lockdown browser is something that will get downloaded onto your computer. And uh, so if you checked your emails today, sometime this afternoon, I sent you uh, two emails that are instructions about the exams. Uh, so I want you to take a good look at them. And uh, one of the things that I've done is I've set up a practice quiz. So it just has one question, but that's a chance for you to try the lockdown browser and uh, get an idea how, how it works. Uh, I have some other notes here. So it says here, log in through Moodle using your usual browser. If you do have it downloaded already, you need to log into Moodle using Chrome or, or Edge or, or um, Firefox or something like that to access the test. Uh, then it's going to go through uh, a system check. It's going to check that your webcam works. It's going to check that your microphone works uh, and a few other things. So that'll take a couple of minutes to set that up. So I want you to do that for the first time uh, before the exam. So do this as soon as you can. I would like to have the entire class done this by Friday. I want to hear if you have any technical difficulties before Friday because it is your responsibility to make sure your technology works. I don't want it to be three o'clock on Monday and somebody's telling me they don't have a computer or, or something like that. Uh, that is your responsibility and uh, you know if you, if you don't have this set up you, you do so at your own risk. Uh, and if there are technical issues I need to hear about them so that I can consult with the uh, 
IT people here and, and maybe sort things out if there are any issues. Uh, what else do I have here? It says here, if something does not work for you, there are solutions. Okay, I don't want this to be an extra stressor for you. I know that uh, this year has been wonky in general. Uh, doing exams this way is just not natural. Um, but uh, uh, so if, if you do have a, a massive technology failure or, you know, the guy down the street cuts into the, uh, the Ethernet cables or something like that, um, I need to know right away. I need to know what's going on. And uh, we'll deal with this on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you know, if, if it doesn't work for you, uh, something that we can do is we can, uh, you know, just not have that midterm for you and make your other midterm the final with a lot more. That's not an ideal situation, but it's one of the best things we can do. If you do have some sort of failure, then I don't have to, you know, find a witness that your, your cat bit the cable or, or, you know, something like that. Because normally if you miss a midterm, I need, you know, medical note or something like that to, to prove that you do have an excused absence. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions about that, let me know, right? I do take academic honesty very seriously. I do want you to learn cell biology. I do want you to learn my material. And I do want to make sure that it's fair for everyone that uh, everybody is doing this properly. So this is why we're using the lockdown browser. So do try this as soon as you can with the sample quiz and take a look at the instructions that I've given you. I know they're kind of long, but I want to make sure everything is there so you understand what's going on. And like I said, if this is your first midterm, uh, this won't be the last. You're going to do them for all of your other courses, presumably, and uh, a lot of uh, other instructors are going to be using the lockdown browser this semester and probably for the final exams. So we want to make sure we have a good run through and we have, uh, we're comfortable with all this technology. So I do have these PowerPoints here uh, on, on Moodle, but I do want to talk a little bit about uh, studying and, and those kind of things. And like I said, we're going to have a full review session on Friday. Uh, so this is just a cute little thing I found on, on uh, Google. And you can see it says here, studying, active eating, texting, watching TV with an open textbook nearby. So I'm hoping that's not what you're doing, right? I'm hoping you're not doing that or maybe tuning into the Discovery Channel or hoping that there's a, you know, something, a documentary or Netflix or something. Um, all those things are way too passive. If you want to perform uh, well, you want to perform, uh, you know, form long-term memories, and, uh, and connect the pieces and really understand things, you need to engage with the material. And there are many ways to do this. Uh, my biggest recommendation you can see on there is underlined is making your own notes. And there's lots of ways to do that. Some people do these mind map things, which are, have all these flowcharty things going on. Some people use recipe cards. Uh, when I was a student, one of the things that I did was I tried to put every topic I'd make, I, I wanna make one page for every unit. So one page for bacteria, one page for macromolecules. That, that was sort of my goal and how I studied. And it took me a lot of time. But by the time I had finally made that one page, I'd gone through my notes, I'd organized them in my own mind, I'd formed those memories, and I started to learn the material uh, really well. Uh, review the study questions and vocabulary words. Like I said, that's where I start when I, I, I make a, an exam. I look at those things for inspiration. And then I start writing the questions based on, on uh, some of that material. I will have some hard ones and I will have some easy ones. Hopefully they're all somewhere in the middle and they're gonna give a fair, um, uh, you know, a fair asking of the things that we learned uh, up to date. Uh, give me a call, send me an email. If you have any questions, I will, I will respond to those. So you can see this here is just kind of what I just said. You know, what's passive, what is constructive? Uh, here's a student of mine actually took my suggestion a few years ago and he said, hey, look what I did. I took your suggestion and I put all of topic one uh, into a page and I said, hey, can I share that with other with future students? And he said, sure. So there it is. Uh, so you get an idea of what that might look like. So what topics did we cover? One through six. So introduction, we talked a lot about cell parts, prokaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells. Uh, let me see here. I see we're just kind of running out of time. So I'm going to go through some of this pretty quick. I have some summaries on each of these slides. Uh, we've seen some multiple choice questions already. There's true or false questions, uh, macromolecules. So definition questions, I mentioned, uh, if I have definition questions on the midterm, it's going to be, you're going to want a full thought or full sentence. It doesn't have to be a sentence, but what I, I want you to get away from are one word answers. 
right? So most of my definition questions are, I'm, I'm making the definition worth one, and I'm gonna have half a mark for certain keywords and another half a mark for other keywords. Another thing you can see there is examples. Those are very important, right? If you can give me examples, you're going to, you're going to show me that you know what you're talking about, right? That's your job when studying and writing exams, by the way. Your job is to somehow convince me that you get it, right? And if you're using vague and wishy-washy words, I am not going to be convinced, okay? So make sure you are thorough and examples are always good. Uh, topic three, there's another definition, true and false. Like I said, I kind of want to get to some stuff at the end here. We talked about the food mosaic model, and I think I showed you this picture. Uh, I was going to do this table, maybe we'll do that on Friday. I know there's a couple things at the end here I want to mention before I let you go. So all these beautiful animations go into waste. So long answer. Uh, I haven't decided how I want to do this yet. Uh, like I said, with the online system, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different. Uh, but traditionally what I do is I give people three long answer questions and you answer two of them. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to do that with the online system yet. I may have more like uh, uh, questions that are worth five marks, but they may not be a full long answer. So by long answer, usually I mean a traditional where you're filling a whole page with kind of a mini essay or, or, or you're comparing contrasting things in a table. Uh, so what I might do is still have the question, but then maybe ask you some sub questions about it or something like that. I have not not decided yet. Uh, but here's a typical kind of question, compare and contrast prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, right? So when you're answering this kind of question, uh, don't just say prokaryotics are small and eukaryotics are big, right? I don't think I'm going to give you a mark for that. Uh, but, you know, if you can tell me the exact sizes, that's, that's got to be worth something, right? So you can see in my note, it says it's worth five points. So discuss at least five points, uh, you know, just to make sure you're getting those five marks. Some things are going to be essential. If you're talking about prokaryotics and eukaryotic, you better say one of them has a nucleus and the other does not, right? That's something that has to be part of that answer. If you're really unorganized, uh, I might dock you marks for that because you know what, if I have to read your question seven times in order to understand what on earth you're talking about, uh, that's very frustrating and you don't want to have the person who's grading your exam frustrated, okay? You want to make me happy, have it organized, clear, and all those kind of things. Uh, so this is kind of where I just wanted to finish off today and mention, you know, here's some of the, the major concepts that we've covered, right, uh, as a place to start. We've talked about cellular structures, both prokaryotic and eukaryotic structures. We've compared those two types of cells, prokaryotics and eukaryotes. Uh, we talked about microscopy, macromolecules, and the scientific method. So if you want to think about kind of in a nutshell what we've covered, take a look at that. The last thing you can see that it says there is check out the sample midterm on Moodle. Now that one was a few years ago. I can't, I can't even remember if that one was mine or, or a different instructor because uh, there used to be another guy here who taught biology 107. Uh, but it's uh, very similar to the format I use for paper exams. Uh, so you get an idea of the style of questions and what they're going to look like. So sorry I went a couple of minutes over time here. I do have a good luck balloon for you. Uh, so let me know if you have any questions, and uh, we'll finish there. And like I said, all of Friday will be a review session for our midterm. And so try that lockdown browser test quiz, and, uh, and let me know if you have any issues. Other than that, have a great afternoon. Happy Wednesday. Hope you have a great evening.